everyone. Welcome to Book Your Summer Live. Uh, I'm Lindsay Elias. I'm a director of consumer shows and conferences at Penguin Random House. I'm really excited to be moderating this panel with four of our amazing debut authors. Um, this is the first live panel of our event and there's lots more to come. So definitely check out um, our website for the full schedule, bookyoursummerlive.com. But first, I was really happy to be asked to moderate this panel because I think being a debut author is a really special moment in any writer's career. And I can't wait to learn more about each of our authors that we have with us here today, their process, their experience of being published and more. So now I'd like to invite the authors to join me. Um, I'll start by introducing them and then we'll move on to some questions. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. So I'll start by introducing our authors. We have Ross Anderson. Uh, she trained as a dancer, but now works as a copywriter and a design journalist. She's written for publications, including The Guardian, The Independent, and Elle Decoration, and The Hierarchies is Ross's debut novel. Daniel Hornsby holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Michigan, where he received Hopwood Awards for both short fiction and the novel, and an MTS from Harvard Divinity School. His stories and essays have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Electric Literature, The Missouri Review, and Joyland. Via Negativa is Daniel's debut novel. Makaya Johnson received her Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing from the University of California, Riverside, and her Master's of Fine Arts um, in Fiction from Rutgers University, Camden. She now studies Afri uh, American literature at Vanderbilt University, where she focuses on critical race theory and automatons. The Space Between Worlds is Makaya's debut novel. And last, we have Megal Majumdar. Uh, she was raised in India, but she moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, where she was a Traub scholar, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at John Hopkins University. She works as an editor at Catapult, and A Burning is Mega's debut novel. So that's enough from me. Um, I was hoping to start by asking each of you to tell us briefly about your novel and what it means to you to be a debut novelist. So I'll start with uh, Ross. Thank you. Um, so my novel, The Hierarchies, is a kind of diary of an AI robot woman who is a companion to a rich man um, and her husband, as she thinks of him, uh, gives her a diary to start writing her thoughts in and in the process of doing that she comes to see that maybe the affluent household that she lives in is not such a brilliant situation for her. Um, so it's a book about kind of feminism and self-discovery and what it means to be human. Um, and yes, being published, I, I don't know, what can I say? It's really thrilling. Um, yeah, wonderful. I'm really um, delighted to be here today with, with everyone that's having the same experience. Great, thank you, Ross. Uh, Dan, you wanna tell us about Via Negativa? Sure, yeah, so uh, Via Negativa follows a uh, Catholic priest who's retired and living in out of his Toyota Camry. Um, it's a road novel, so he's you know on a trip, though his purpose is gradually kind of become clear. Um, but he tries to steal a, a wounded coyote in the backseat of his car he runs into some peculiar characters. Um, and it really, you know, the via negativa means like the negative road or the negative way. Um, and he kind of uses this theological, tra loose theological tradition um, to also maybe justify uh, not addressing, you know, areas where he should be more responsible or accountable. So you gradually learn what he is in denial about, kind of as you follow his little journey. Yeah. Thank you. Kaya. Yes, hi. Um, 
So my novel is a science fiction novel that deals with the multiverse as kind of an examination of privilege. And it's funny, Dan, as you said, the that your novel is a road novel. Mine is kind of the road not taken novel, where the main character, Kara, is kind of able to see alternate selves in other worlds. And not many of them, she dies a lot, but I'm able to see like, oh, here's how these different, these tiny little factors affect outcomes. And so for me, it very much is like a novel that uses the multiverse to examine like these small conditional changes that dramatically affects the outcome of somebody's life. And of course, it's very much like she works for a corporation and there's going to be like secrets revealed and wackiness, but essentially um, that's what it is. That's very cool. And it's interesting to see where novels that seemingly are really different also have parallels and things that overlap. Um, Mega, can you tell us about The Burning? Yeah, um, well, first off, Dan, Kaya, and Ross, your books sound amazing. I'm very excited to read them. Um, a Burning is a novel which is about three characters who are chasing big ambitions as the society around them makes this pretty dangerous turn toward right-wing nationalism. Um, and being published, you know, I think that for so long while I was writing the book, I kept it really quiet because I really saw it as an act of communication and I didn't want to open up other channels for that communication to happen. Like I wanted that energy to stay so much in the book. And now that it's out, it feels like that act has been completed or like when a reader comes to it and like brings their own experiences to it or picks up on an aspect of it that perhaps I didn't really think about that feels like the book is completed somehow and and I'm really grateful for that. That's really cool and that is um, actually a perfect transition to my uh, second question which takes us back to a little bit to the beginning of of your process, um, all of your processes of writing. Um, at what point did you realize that you were writing a novel and did that change your approach at all? If that wasn't your in initial starting point. Um, and Dan, can we start with you? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because it's like, I'm sure it's probably the case um, with the rest of you too, maybe, um, where you throw away some things right? Like you start some projects and it's kind of like packing for like a hike or something where like if you don't have enough stuff, you might go really far really fast and then you're like, I don't have any food. It's like, I don't have a tent. Um, but if you have too much stuff, you get tired and you can't really, you can't really travel. You know what I mean? Um, so I think like figuring out like how much stuff do I need to start? Because you can discover, uh, the book is writing, right? But you kind of need to be like, oh, okay, I might go here, I might go there. Um, and to be a negativa, I think I realized like with the kind of coyote subplot, with some of the stuff dealing with like the trauma and pain of you know, the sex abuse crisis in the Catholic Church, um, with some of the theological components, I realized, okay, now I'm, I can kind of juggle these things. Um, you can tell it. And I think I have like enough to get to the end. Of it. Um, and so it's like as I was kind of filling out index cards, you know, with little chunks of the book, um, and those were like fusing together and talking to each other more and more, um, I realized I had something I could kind of see through and really put it on myself. And... That's cool. Yeah, it seems like I, I love the idea of picturing index cards and trying to put all those different, I'm sure that might be some things in common um, across the four of you. Um, but um, that's awesome. Um, how about um, Kaya, why don't you tell us about um, when you realized you were writing a novel and what that meant? Um, yeah, so certainly like I typically write in long form. So there's always like the hope that you're writing a novel. And it's more like the surprise, like, oh, like this is still viable. Like, we've made it past 60,000 words. This might actually make it as opposed to like, you know, those projects that you end up like piling up in your woodshed of like, you know, the, the poor dead darlings. Um, and so it was really just that notice by it's like, oh wait, no, like this actually has legs and I'm excited by it. And there's enough in here to be excited by it. And like privately for me, I kind of view my novel as kind of two halves together. 
Um, that's like my own inside joke with myself. And so it is that when I got past that hurdle of like the middle part where I knew exactly how I wanted to go, I was like, oh, like I can actually, and I love that hiking analogy, Dan, I'm definitely going to steal that and pretend that I invented it later at cocktail parties. But just like that envision where I can see the end and it's like, oh, there is an end and it's Bible and I actually want to get there was like just quite an exciting time. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a really daunting task to write a novel. You know, I, I imagine it's certainly not easy. Um, uh, Mega, why don't you tell us about your experience? Um, I think I knew pretty early on because the story felt so big to me and I had these characters who in order to write them with complexity um, I had to give them space and depth and I kind of knew that I was working with something that would end up being bigger than a short story but really it was in the writing of the novel that I think I learned the discipline of writing a novel, you know? So I don't think there was any point where I thought, well, definitely, I know this is what it's going to be. I know I'm going to finish it. I don't think I knew that it would be done until I did it, you know? And just having that discipline to come back to the page every day. And certainly for me, many days facing my own failures on the page and, you know, looking at sections that weren't working, that I wasn't happy with, having the discipline to be in that space and face that over and over, I think taught me how to write a novel. Discipline seems to be a important word. Um, Ross? Yeah, I, I, yes, I sympathize with all of that. I felt a lot of the same, but um, I, on this occasion, I felt like I knew from the moment I, I had the idea that it was a novel and I'd been struggling with something else that I'd been writing kind of piecemeal for literally a decade and I was just so sick of it. It was making me so unhappy. And I had this idea and I thought, I'm just going to write that just for me then. And there's no pressure on myself. But I did go every single day to a cafe and write a bit more and write a bit more. Um, but yeah, it was funny. I, I've not had that experience before, but as soon as the idea came into my head, I thought, oh, yeah. Definitely, I can see what that's, you know, not every aspect of it, but, um, and then that gave me the energy to keep going every day and push away those worries and think, well, I'll just, I'll just do a bit more, I'll just do a bit more. Um, so yeah, it was a really different experience to other things that I've written. Um, and yeah, really enjoyable actually for that reason. It kind of had that momentum to it, I guess. That's really neat. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting how those two different projects you talk about, one of the took you, you know, you worked on for a decade versus, you know, one that happened much, much quicker and a creative process just came to you. It's fascinating how that works. Um, so my next question, you don't have to answer all the components of this question. So kind of pick one that you, you find interesting, but thinking about how you felt when you found out you were being published. Um, was there anything kind of surprising to you about the publishing process or alternatively, or also, um, tell us a little bit about cover design and picking the title and all those kind of nitty gritty publishing things. Um, Kaya, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm an academic and when my book was actually sold, I was, you know, I'm still in coursework. Um, working toward my PhD. And so it was this kind of high low where I was like, I have a book coming out and everyone's like, shut up and do your homework. You know, it just it kept <laughs> me very grounded having those, like, it was almost so surreal um, having these kind of dual expectations and being in these two very different places. Um, and the thing that I think I found most surprising and that I always want to tell other writers is we tend to be very imaginative and very hopeful. Wherever you think you are, you're actually two years away from that spot. I think when we get an idea for a novel, we're like, I've practically written a novel. And when we've gotten, when we've written our novel, we're like, I practically have an agent. And when we get our agent, we're like, this thing is sold. But it's just that moment of just like, you know, there is this like long deray often between like, even when you sell the book and then when you get that like, to hold it in your hands. And of course with COVID, it was a slightly longer delay. 
than anticipated, but just that like, make sure that you're not, you know, getting ahead of yourself. Cause I certainly was, I was just like, yes, 2018, let's do this. And then it was just like, no, 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 sit tight. It's, this is a long oh, notorial yeah. process. It is a long process and you have to be very patient and keep that like stamina throughout it. So you're clearly an underachiever getting your PhD <laughs> while you're writing a novel. So, um, uh, Mega, how about you? Um, Kaya, you know what you just said about learning that your book has sold. I was thinking about when I heard um, that we had an offer. I was actually at a conference in Berkeley um, and uh, I, I work as an editor also. So I was at this conference pitching my books and then I got this call and I had to kind of slip out and take it and it was wild. Um, but I think a thing that I, I feel so grateful for and that I don't think is often very visible to others is how many people work on a book um, you know, as the, as the writer, yes, you write it, but then, you know, your agent and your editor help you shape it in really significant ways. There are people, like you mentioned, working on the cover art, which is so vital. Um, but then there are also so many people like in sales and marketing. And so it's just a ton of people touch a book and they yeah. do so with so much care and generosity and thoughtfulness. And, you know, they, their, their name is not on the book, but their work, I think of it as like their work blesses the book and it's totally. a kind of crucial blessing. Yeah. That's really nice to hear. And I, and I think folks on the other side of it from the publishing side feel just so lucky to have the content and the authors and the talent you know, that you all have. And so it's just a joy in both directions, which is lovely. Um, Ross, what about you? What's your experience with uh, being published like? Um, yeah, I, um, yeah, I had quite a strange experience of finding out that um, we had a offer for the book. Um, yeah, a similar thing to what you were describing, a, a lot of things going on. So it was kind of a bit of a, roller coaster of the whole thing. Um, but my experience of, you were also asking about the cover and the title and that, you know, um, my experience of that has been so positive. And I have a friend here in the UK who publishes thrillers and she said to me about the cover, you all, you know, you just got to accept the cover. You'll probably hate it. They won't want to know, blah, blah, blah. And actually my experience was that the people I worked with were so collaborative and so open to my suggestions and you know, they really, really wanted me to like it, you know? Um, so that was great. That really um, defied my expectations of how, um, yeah, just everyone was very keen to kind of work together and with me to get the right thing. So that was a real pleasure. Cool, that's nice. That must be a really nice feeling when you feel heard and you end up with a beautiful cover. You all, all of your books have beautiful, stunning covers. Um, Dan, what about you? Yeah, uh, when we went to, you know, went out to sell the manuscript, I was working at a restaurant as a, as a bartender and a waiter. And so it was kind of surreal where I was like d ducking into the bathroom or the walk-in, you know, freezer to be like, oh, what? Oh, okay. Uh, and then my boss is like knocking on the door being like, we have people here. And uh, so that was strange. And you can't, you're not really telling people at work about it because it just feels like, you're like, they're not gonna care. <laughs> and that also gives you some perspective too, <laughs> where you're like, cool, like here's the world. I gotta, I have to, you know, kind of keep this going. Um, so that was surreal. Um, but at the same time, there was like, I have a lot of like, you know, my writing community here in Memphis where I live is really supportive and could celebrate with me. So it wasn't like I was like just crying in the walk-in or something. Um, but yeah, it I, kind of like what Mega was saying, like it does feel kind of unfair sometimes that there's like one name on the front of your book and you're like a book by me. Um, when you think of all of the people you collaborate to really bring it into the world and the acknowledgements really don't do, they're like what? 
a, some dense paragraphs at the back of the thing and they don't really do it justice sometimes. Um, when I think of my agent, uh, Chris, or my editor, Anna, or even just with like, you know, publicity and marketing with like Rose and Julianne, it's like crazy how many people like bring this thing into the world. And then your readers and your friends who give you pep talks when you're despairing because you're trying to figure out some esoteric causality um, with a character or their psychology. Um, yeah. Takes a village. Yeah, it does, it does. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so talking about, so all of your books um, are works of fiction. Um, Alice Walker said, fiction is such a world of freedom. It's wonderful. If you want someone to fly, they can fly. So my question is, did you make anyone fly in your novels? Um, but if not, what kind of freedom did you find or do you find in writing fiction? Um, uh, Mega, I'll start with you. That's a great question. Um, you know, I was writing about ordinary people who find that the systems and institutions that they live within do not serve them. And they seek other ways to move ahead. They seek other ways to hold on to their humor and their spirit and chase the kind of meaningful life that they want. So I think being able to write these characters who, yes, face significant suffering and face significant barriers, but at the same time, they exceed their suffering as real people do. They are much more than the difficulties that they face. And they have a capacity to be joyous and tell jokes and tease. And I think having that space to, to craft these full people and see how they might move within this tough society. And um, I have one character who I loved giving her this absurdly huge dream to chase, which is, you know, from a position of great marginalization, she wants to become a movie star. And she goes to these weekly acting classes, like these amateur little acting classes. And I really loved writing, creating that space of, of dreaming for this character. That mm -hmm. felt like a way to um, give her meaningful freedom. That's lovely. Thank you. Uh, Ross? Um, yeah, I mean, this is um, the first thing that I've written, really, that has kind of a sci-fi element to it, or kind of dystopian element, although I was really not trying to write about the future in any way, but that does kind of liberate you to, uh, you know, you're not bound by the rules of 18th century London or wherever you set your, you know, you can make it up for yourself. Um, so that was fun. But also the fact that my protagonist was a robot, I think that was the most fun thing because it meant I could kind of play with that and try and play with the reader a bit as well. You know, it's all, I wanted you to read it and feel for her so much, but at the, and be outraged that this has happened and that's happened. But at the same time, she's a robot, but you know, that's what she was designed for so that, you know, that um, kind of playing with with things that ordinarily they would happen in a novel and they would be one thing because my protagonist was not was not human which is kind of the point of the book meant I could I don't know just look at things in a different way um, and that was really fun for me not only was I kind of trying to challenge the reader a little bit but other times I would be trying to challenge myself, you know, to write, it sounds horrible, to write something quite upsetting. <laughs> and I would be feeling so much for her and I'd have to say to myself, she's a robot, you know? So um, that the idea of who humans do care for and who they don't is a big part of the book. Um, but that was also a big part of the sort of the experience of writing it. And so sort of working those moral questions um, out as I was writing. Um, sounds kind of heavy, but it was fun. It was really fun to be inventive with that. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, how about you, Dan? Yeah, um, I think when I started the book, so my book, the, the narrator, he's really invested in certain mystical traditions and uses them 
kind of as in some in some places in some ways as a kind of emotional uh you know fire escape um and for me, when I started the book, I think I was much more invested and interested in playing with those ideas and then used it as a way to like tease out the limitations of a certain kind of detachment or a certain kind of spiritual escapism. Um, and so it was really fun for me to pour in little snippets of things, you know, if it was something from like uh, the Desert Fathers of Lower Egypt in the third century, like one of my obsessions for a while. I could put that in the book and make my character talk about it and make it make sense in his life um, and make it have, make, you know, his interests and obsessions have consequences for him. Um, and so, you know, while it's like, it is, I, I guess, uh, uh, you know, there's some degree of naturalism um, I did feel like, you know, there, I had a lot of freedom to play with those ideas and play with my own, like, weird, you know, medieval obsessions, you know? Yeah, it's interesting that even when it's not a, a dystopian or a sci-fi that, there, you know, you do still have that room um, to, yeah. to explore. Um, uh, Kaya? Um, yeah, first of all, Roz, if you ever want to bounce like post-humanist and embodied AI ideas off anybody, I am your girl. Hit me up. <laughs> <That is my laughs> the work that you've been doing and stuff so interesting. Fascinating. Um, but to get back to this question, which was amazing, the idea of who I wanted to, um, who I wanted, wanted to see fly. Um, thank you for asking this. And I'm going to give the answer that everybody hates. Whenever I do a written interview, this is the answer that gets deleted. This is the answer that editors cut. <laughs> But the people that I wanted to hold up in my book um, a lot were sex workers and sex providers. And I really wanted to showcase how they are essential to the fabric of society and historically have been. And so that was one of the things I was most passionate about having full control of a world is to kind of not create this reality, but demystify and like make it explicit as opposed to how we kind of obscure their contributions uh, historically to civilization. Um, and so that's absolutely when I think about I'm using a very metaphorical like um, use of fly here, but that's why I absolutely wanted to hold up and I wanted to be very careful with and generous with in my depiction. That's really interesting. So the freedom you found was in, in, in talking about something openly in a way that it, it hadn't, it, you know, it normally yeah. isn't to, to give it that attention. Yeah. So kind of in the same vein then. So this is for Ross um, and Kaya. Tell us a little bit more about what it was like to develop a world that's uh, near future. Um, Ross, you'd mentioned it's not really far future, you know, it's um, dystopian, but we, and obviously we have a lot of AI happening right now and a lot of speculation there. What was it like to develop those future, near future science fiction worlds? Um, and then were there aspects of the real world, events or locations, experiences that really helped you shape that? Um, Kaya, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so when I first got the idea for this book was, um, I think it was October 2016, and I was like, I'm going to start writing. And instead, November 2016 happened, and then like May of 2017, it was like, I'm going to start writing. Just kidding, this time for real. But certainly there was so much rhetoric around travel bans and borders and the kind of restricted movement. And I'm such a stubborn human being that of course I reacted to this with like, no, instead we're going to traverse worlds. We're going to invent a character that has, you know, very little limitations on movement and can, you know, do these unthinkable movements. Um, quite the interesting thing is there are so many people um, who've been quoting things in the book as like dystopian elements that just exists. There was one review that was like, oh, there's like, they're like, there's a desert and there's an empty bed where river used to be. And I'm just like, that's just the Mojave. And they're like seeing these elements of like my, like that I know and exist and like where my family lives that are just like, you can tell it's a dystopian wasteland. And I'm just like, my feelings, my feelings. Um, so that's been like very interesting that there are things in it that are real world that people still perceive as like a dark future when I'm just like, that was just Tuesday. <laughs> I love that. That's, yeah, that's a little frightening. Wait a minute, that's, that's my backyard right now. <laughs> um, Ross, how about you? Uh, yeah, exactly the same. Um, it, th this is now, you know, this happened this morning at breakfast. Um, and my way of kind of a, um, 
doing that is there's hardly any tech in the book. I'm a complete Luddite. I've only just bought an iPhone, you know, um, and the things that I was using for research or inspiration, I was looking back in time. So my robot lives, her husband's an antiques dealer, so she lives amongst very old things. Um, and the, the things that I was most inspired by, I was actually reading diaries and writing from a thousand years ago in Japan when women in the imperial courts were starting to keep diaries kind of for their own entertainment um, in Japanese. Chinese was used for history and kind of business and everything so they were kind of developing a literature in, um, in their own language sort of unseen um, and these are things that are considered sort of some of the earliest novels and certainly written by women so I guess yeah to sort of emphasize that point in a way that this this is now you know there's nothing I'm, I'm not predicting anything in the future was one way I did that was kind of drawing on historical writers and settings even um, but then at the same time you know I was writing about AI and the funny thing about that is that just you're running to keep up you know you've just written this thing and the next week there's a news story that you're you know oh that's much more extraordinary than what I just made up you know so when you're writing about tech things move fast so that was you know in another way I was kind of I had a lot of material you know every week there's something on the news to make me think about what I was writing so that was really good did you find that it was harder for you as someone who maybe isn't as as tech savvy to dive into all of that? You know, was that difficult or? Um... Yeah, and I just gave up. I, I ordered <laughs> these books about AI and then I got a certain way through to work, like equations and stuff. And I just, I, I just thought, oh. Um, but then it's funny, you know, with like research before a book, you never know what, maybe what's going to be useful. And I thought, oh, those will be really useful to me, those books explaining how a system... That are, and I just didn't find what I was looking, you know, which is things that make your imagination or your sort of language that just makes you go, oh, yeah, I can do something with that. No, I found all of that in things written a thousand years ago, but they are translated. So, you know, the, the idea of, that a robot speaking to us, that's sort of translated from binary or whatever. So, you know, those kind of ideas, but no, when it comes, it, the moral issues around AI, that's absolutely fascinating. How it actually works, you know, mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you how my telephone works and my TV works and I, I'm no further along since I've wrote the book, I'm afraid. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, so for Dan and Mega, your, your books are not science fiction, uh, fantasy, or dystopian. Um, a Burning takes place in contemporary India uh, via Negativa as a cross-country trip across within the United States. Um, what kind of research did you have to do to create authentic uh, locations in your novel? And, you know, what makes the choice of those locations important to your storytelling? Um, Dan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, in one way I kind of cheated where, you know, I grew up in Indiana, so I, I, I know, you know, the place where uh, Dan's parish is, right? Like I know that world. Um, and then I lived in Kansas for a while. A lot of the novel is in Kansas. Um, I've had friends who, you know, lived in Seattle. So I wanted to string together places that I knew um, where I could, you know, I did some research where it's like, okay, I have a bottomless pit in the middle of Kansas. And I wanted to know what the dirt would kind of look like if you were scanning, you know, from the grass down into a deep hole. And so I called one of my friends who grew up in uh, near the actual ge you know, geographical center of our country, like three miles away from that, like the, the point that they say is the middle. Um, and he's like, okay, it's gonna be clay. And then you're gonna have the, you're gonna have some silt here. You're gonna have, a, and then it will be yeah clay and some rock. And, and so I was able to kind of get some of those facts that way. Um, but I did spend a lot of time on Google Maps trying to make sure I like okay if he leaves here, 
how many how many hours in the car will it take for him to get to this city or this town? Does he need to like like if I want him to be there at night for whatever reason, do I need him to like fall asleep or you know? So there's a lot of kind of like weird Google Maps math as well, just to make sure that like if you were doing that trip, uh, would it kind of match your own experience? Um, but I've made that drive a couple times, and it really is dotted with bizarre landmarks like. The giant cross in Effingham, Illinois, that's seemingly made out of garage doors that you can see, you know, from miles away, that kind of thing. So it's like a mix of experience and then just making sure, because I don't want someone from Kansas or someone from, you know, Eastern Washington to read and be like, that. it's not like that, mm -mm. you know. I, w I want them to buy into the kind of emotional reality and people get really hung up on, on those little things and it kind of creates this disjunct, I think, for some readers. So I did a lot of work to make sure that that held up. Yeah, I was going to say, someone on Goodreads is going to point out that that yeah. trip actually <laughs> would take you five right. days. Exactly. They're going to be just telling it all. Up. Yeah. And it doesn't matter that you're writing fiction and that you can make it however you want, but right, right. you know, you want it to be authentic. Um, and Mega, again, your novel takes place in contemporary India. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, you know, I have a background in anthropology, so I really love reading ethnographies. Um, and I read ethnographies of Hijra communities to write about a particular character in the book. I also found YouTube really helpful to gain access to places where I couldn't go. Um, on YouTube, there are all of these local news channel videos, like kind of rough documentaries where they go into places like the kitchen in a women's prison, which was a place that I needed to write about, but I had no access to. So it was really helpful to watch these um, news clips, which, you know, gave you a sense for the textures and spaces and the kinds of activity that went on. Um, but so much of this book comes from observation. I grew up in India. Um, I finished high school there. I only moved to the U.S. to go to undergrad. And, you know, my parents still live there. My extended family is still there. So I go home every year and I still feel very connected to India. And so I knew that I wanted to write about um, the, the richness of the place. You know, I wanted to write about the guava seller at the corner with whom you have a kind of relationship and you like buy guavas from them sometimes. I wanted to write about trains where, you know, in a, in a seat meant for three people, you inevitably have like five people trying to shove their way in, like, like getting annoyed at each other. And I wanted to write about through those visual details, I wanted to write about the particular intelligence and humor and the kind of small but really meaningful relationships that form, you know, the kind of relationship that sustains a neighborhood, the kind of temporary society of a train. I found that really a rich place for storytelling. And you have a train on the cover of the book, right? I do, yes. Oh my god, I'm so happy they worked it in. It's very tiny, but it's here. <laughs> yeah. it gets placement. Um, and I think those details you were mentioning are so important when you, as a reader, of feeling transported, um, truly transported, when it's those really little things that are just so authentic and real that take you away. So it's really, really cool. Um, Okay, so we're gonna move on to another question um, and then we're gonna start um, some Q&A in a few minutes. But um, Ernest Hemingway said, the hard part about writing a novel is finishing it. So I would love to know from each of you, what did you find hard about writing a novel? We've, we've touched on some of it a little bit, but you know, is there, is there one thing in particular that was really difficult for you to get past in that process? And um, Ross, I'd love to start with you. Um, well, I kind of touched on it before when I was saying about going to the cafe every day, you know, for me, the hardest thing about finishing a novel is just keeping faith with yourself. You know, it's such a long process and you've got to keep telling yourself, no, this is what, you know, you can't get it done in a day. <laughs> 
you can only get a tiny bit of it done each time. So to, to think, no, it is worth sitting down to just do that tiny bit today and then tomorrow and so on. So that, that I've always found quite difficult. But this one, I, you know, I did keep faith with it and I was really enthusiastic. So for me, um, kind of what you were saying about Daniel, that came at the end, the kind of tying up the plot. Okay, well, the phone needs to be on that table so that da -da -da, that I found, that took as long as, you know, writing the whole thing was just sorting out those really, <laughs> dare I say it, boring details at the end. You know, it's not my forte. Yeah, so yeah just that I found difficult tax it's really taxing getting your man in the car at the right time to arrive and yeah. as you say yeah and it's interesting because I've never thought of it that way but thinking about like you're the writer you're in control like you can you know you you can make sure that that guy's in that car but like you said it actually it takes a lot of moving around and making sure that the the right pieces are in place um because again someone on Goodreads will point out that that phone was not there in the last scene <laughs> Um, uh, uh, Kaya, how about you? Um, yeah, so for me, it's less about the writing, but that first edit, when you've just word vomited for 120,000 words, and then you have to face this disgusting thing you've made, um, <laughs> that first time going back in, for me, it's like listening to the sound of my own voice. It's just like, uh, it's so... I always put it off. I always complain the entire time. Like you can track my mood dipping from when I'm doing that first edit. And subsequent edits are far easier because I've kind of molded the shape of the thing and I've like scraped off some of like the gross parts. But that first, you know, cause I tend to like write very quickly and just want to get it all out. And that first kind of like, oh God, what did I do? It's like that thing you find in the back of the fridge. Um, so that first edit I is always my most dreaded part. It's my least favorite part. I, I hate it. Yeah, it sounds, that sounds rough. <laughs> uh, Dan, how about you? Yeah, I really relate to what Kaya just said. Um, you know, like with, with my novel, it's like there was a moment where I kind of had a draft and then I needed to put that into the computer. And that was fun because I was like cleaning it up polishing sentences, shifting things around. There's something kind of exciting and, and creative there. But then I printed that out and I was like going through the sentences and making sure that the sentences and paragraphs like made sense, that they connected, that there was a certain kind of flow between them. Um, and sometimes it's like, you know, if like, if reading is driving through a landscape, you know, writing a scene can be like crawling through it where you're like, okay, I like, sometimes your quality of attention is much greater to some of these things than a reader will ever, it certainly is much greater than a reader will kind of give. Um, and so that kind of like, you know, grabbing, I guess I have like a purple pen right here, but just like going through and being like, does this make sense? Can you track it? Does this agree? Does that work syntactically? Um, I could get like fixated for, you know, a whole day on just like a line or two or a paragraph or a character's thought um, that I probably shouldn't have obsessed over. It really it would just, it would stay with me and I like needed to meditate to get it out sometimes, honestly. What makes it all the more impressive when you finish and you're done and you have this Yeah, it's a work. crucial part of the process, but it, you know, it can be like very exhausting. I'm sure y'all can relate to that. Mega, can you relate to that or you have a, your own, your own story? <laughs> no, I do. I really like what you're saying, Dan, about even though it's this big document that you have, the attention to the sentence level and the scene level is what really makes it. Um, so for me, you know, a, a challenge that I set myself with a burning was, um, can I write something that's intellectually serious, but is also really fun to read. And then I had to think really deeply about, well, what do I mean by fun? What kind of absorption yeah. am I looking for? And how can I turn that question of absorption into sentence level or scene level questions, you know? So how can I interrogate what each sentence is doing? Sometimes you start off writing a sentence which is kind of here and what it really wants to say is somewhere over here. And so you have to write like seven drafts before you get to where the sentence needs to be and where it is the most 
truthful version of itself. And so holding that whole fictional world in your mind as you go through it sentence by sentence and think about how your chapters open and close, you know, what kind of yeah. landing arrives? What does a scene do? What makes a scene? You know, what has changed so that it is a scene? Um, that kind of stuff is so slow, takes me so much work, but, but um, yeah, I guess that is how you ultimately finish something that you can stand behind and be proud of. It's interesting that none of you said that it was hard to finish it though, like, to, you know, like end the story itself, you know, but that's good. You all, <laughs> you all knew exactly where you wanted to go and how to get there. So that's good. Um, okay. I'm going to ask you one more question and then we're going to switch to some questions that we've received from our audience, but I selfishly want to know the answer to this. Um, so all of your books are recently out or they're coming out very soon. So what do you, what, what did you do to celebrate or what are you planning to do to celebrate, um, especially during these difficult times? Um, you know, we can't have big parties, but what are, what are you planning on doing um, to celebrate this great accomplishment? Um, Dan? Yeah, um, my book actually came out on, the, on my wife's birthday, which was like just really fun. Um, so we had like, you know, I live in Memphis, Tennessee. Kai, are you in Nashville? Is that right? Yeah, I'm in Nashville. I was going to say Tennessee. That's, that's so funny. What a little connection there. Um, but so we had like, just like three friends over in the backyard, um, just in a little distant, you know, well ventilated backyard. Um, and that was, not, I mean, they're all like, we have, you know, some writer friends and poet friends who live in town. Um, and artist friends. And so we were able to, you know, kind of celebrate that way. It was really, really nice. And then my first event was sponsored by my, the English department at Kansas State, where, which is where I went for my undergrad, and uh, the, the bookstore where I used to work. Um, so virtually it was a kind of homecoming and I could see, you know, professors who I love, friends and family kind of all there on the astral plane. Really cool, and congratulations. Um, Kaya? Um, yes, yeah, so I certainly, this is obviously not the book launch I had envisioned um, there. So the only, I think, reading that I did was at this site of protest that I've been supporting here in Nashville. So it was really like low key, well, we're here guys, you guys want a reading. Um, but I have the absolute best friends in the entire world. And they like pulled it. There's just like three or four of us, kind of the similar thing where it's a small intimate group where they had like a cake made for me with like all my favorite crazes on it. Cause I had intended kind of not to mark it. I was just so in my head and it's just like, oh, you know, like better luck next time, I guess. But they kind of wouldn't let me get away with that. And so there were sparklers and there was, they put up, I love trivia. So they made an automaton themed trivia and they just did this all like kind of behind my back surprising me. And it was just this really great moment where it's just like, even if you don't like think about celebrating, like your community will celebrate you um, almost in defiance of your wishes. But it was kind of a beautiful and really, I felt very cradled and very happy. That's really beautiful. That's really nice. Sounds like you have amazing friends and congratulations on having that little celebration. I'm glad you had that. Um, Mega, how about you? Um, similar, you know, it's, it's been very low key. I've been very happy to, you know, just receive flowers from friends and colleagues. And I got a beautiful orchid, which is right here and still in bloom, like three months after my book came out, which is astonishing. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been really quiet. In many ways, I felt like just holding all of the truths of what is happening right now. I don't think I've really felt like I'm able to have some big celebration for myself. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to mark it, you know, I see the importance of marking it and, and holding it meaningfully. And maybe that just means, you know, you go for a walk and have some ice cream and, and look at the river and be like, I wrote a book and maybe that's enough for this summer. Sounds kind of lovely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ross, how about you? Yeah, it was interesting what you were saying, Meg. I was doing the kind of edits 
of when the coronavirus happened and the lockdown happened and everything and it was really hard to take it serious you know you just uh, in the early days you're just thinking oh I was just thinking well the, the world's ending really I have to sit and concentrate on whether this sentence needs an exclamation mark or not I, you know that was really hard <laughs> um but uh, so my book comes out on Tuesday um in the US um but it doesn't come out in the UK until the spring so that's in a way there's kind of a bit less pressure on me um here so I'm going to the beach where I live um with my boyfriend and my best friend and a bottle of champagne and that's it that's you yeah. know, perfect. perfect party if you ask me that sounds ideal <laughs> That sounds great. Well, again, congratulations to all of you on your on your recent and you know very soon to be published books. Um, we are going to we have some questions from the audience. So um, let's see. Um, you guys can just kind of jump in and, and answer if if you know if you'd like to. But so from um, so Becky and Shana um, both had questions about agents. So. Can each of you explain how you got um, the attention of your agent um, and how has that relationship been for you so far? I don't know why I wanted to raise my hand. Like, I don't know, I'm an academic guys. So I'm so sorry. Great. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say this because there's things that you hear, I went through an MFA. So there are things you hear a lot, which is just like cold e querying doesn't work and you've got to like have a thing, you've got to have a following, you have to have all these things. But I just want to like say that I got off, I got my agent off of cold querying for a project that wasn't viable. And she literally is, her name's Karen McClure. She's a Donald Mash. She's the best in the whole wide world. And I light a candle to her like she's a saint every day. But she basically, when I had the first project, she was like, oh, I'm not investing in a project from you. I'm investing in an author and then you're in a career. And so even though she was just like, oh, this project is whatever, but I like the way you write. And she really has just like ridden with me through um, again, like a book that she kind of, I think even then knew like, this isn't the book, but I want to be like with you when that book does come. And so it's been just a really amazing experience. Like I have just been, she's been so protective of my time. And again, I got her through just sending out a query letter to somebody I'd never met. We didn't meet at a conference. I didn't pitch her or anything like that. It was literally just that old fashioned email way. And it has worked out I'm so lucky. I'm so insanely lucky. I also, um, you know, reached out via email, queried, um, and I think it definitely does work if you reach out thoughtfully and you know yeah. what other books your agent has championed, and those are books that you have read and loved and that you see in conversation with your work in some way. And I think one good way for anybody starting out to learn about who agented what book is to look at the acknowledgements of the yeah. book and they will usually be thanked. And then you can kind of Google them and look at their page and see what they're working on. So that's a good starting point. Um, and yeah, I feel like my agent, um, Eric Simonoff at WME is absolutely brilliant and helps me do so much work on the, on the book. I'm really grateful. Yeah, I also, you know, send an email, a query email uh, to Chris Clemens at Jenkel and Nesbitt. And what, what I, what happened with me is like, there was a writer whose work I really admired. We were kind of publishing stories and essays and stuff in the same places. And uh, I really liked the stuff that he did. And then I learned that he had a book coming out. And I was like, oh, who's his agent? And then I looked at, you know, his, Chris's other writers looked at some of the stuff they were doing. Um, and then, you know, as we were like talking more um, and he had read my manuscript, like I saw that he understood what I was trying to do. And that he also saw like possibility in it that I didn't necessarily see, like directions for changes, edits, that kind of thing. Um, and I realized like, this is somebody who understands the book and who I can kind of collaborate with. I can take their edits seriously and ideas for revision seriously because they have a vision that you know matches with mine but it's so, uh, sorry that interrupts you but yeah i i think that's so in, important i the same as all of you i just got my agent by emailing people that i thought looked appropriate but the 
first time I maybe didn't. So, you know, I've worked with other agents that maybe I hadn't put so much research into who were great agents, but there is something about, you know, about um, someone that shares your enthusiasms, your take on things. That's really, um, Samuel Hodder is my agent and he's just wonderful at Blake Friedman. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's like meeting a boy or something. You know, when I first met, my mind kept sort of thinking, oh, I must tell Sam about this or Sam would think that's funny or whatever, you know, but you really do, or I have really valued just that connection of somebody that's like-minded and then I think that has really helped, you know, it really helps me trust the feedback that he gives and all of that. Um, it makes a huge, huge difference. So yeah, do your research, definitely. Well, thank you all for sharing um, your, your, you know, your personal experiences with agents. And obviously it's something that anybody who wants to get published always has questions about. So I'm sure people appreciate you um, being open and honest about your own experience. Um, okay, we have time for one more question. And we did get a lot of questions from the audience. So I apologize, we're not gonna have time to answer them all, but um, maybe we can talk to the authors after and we can send you guys a list and we can post your answers somewhere if you're interested. But um, what books or authors, um, what are the books or authors that felt instrumental in you writing books and made you want to, made you want to write? And what are you reading right now? Um, this is from um, Alicia and Veronica. I would say, sorry, I'll jump in. Um, although there are so many writers that I admire and I enjoy and that I've bought everything that they've written, I would say the things that are most sort of fundamental and foundational to me are the books that I read or my mum read to me and that I loved as a child. So um, my kind of innocent protagonist going about this human world that sort of excludes her and is puzzling to her and doesn't seem to really make any logical sense to the way that she's programmed. You know, I was sort of drawing so much on Alice in Wonderland and that kind of precocious child looking around thinking, what? what's the matter with you people? Um, you know, even that sense of kind of wanting to get your freedom, get out to that beautiful garden. Uh, the things like that that captured my imagination when I was really small um, continue to, to do so really. I, you know, the foundations come from those sort of books still. Maybe I'll jump in and quickly recommend a book that I've really loved this summer. Um, it's called The Death of Vivek Oji it's by Akweke Mezi. Um, and it's a novel which is absolutely heartbreaking and gorgeous. Um, but I highly recommend it for other writers too, because something that I was struck by is the structure and movement of narrative in this book. Um, the author just holds multiple perspectives. The story jumps back and forth in time. There are these layers and layers of mystery and revelation. So it's a really beautiful book, I think, to study for structure as well. And that cover. Yes, gorgeous cover. <laughs> I'm a cover person, so it's always <laughs> noticed. <laughs> um, uh, Dan, what about you? Any uh, writing influences or anything you're reading right now? Yeah, um, I just finished this book called Bluebird, Bluebird by Attica Locke. Have any of you read any of Attica Locke's books? Um, but she writes about like black communities in Texas, um, which like there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of representation there in books. Um, and they, you know, they have this like, kind of mystery component, um, but highly recommended for a, a summer read. Um, and just like, I'm like, why isn't there a mini series of this? Like, it's, it's amazing. Um, as far as writers that like really, like, made me want to write, it's like, uh, I remember like, in college reading Borges for the first time. And I was like, this is so different than anything I've ever read. It's so geometrical and so weird. It felt kind of liberating. Like what could a story be, you know? And it's like, it could have a, it could have a geometry, you know? Um, so like Borges and think, yeah, that is like incredibly liberating. And Kafka too, I know these are so basic, but like, just like being the kind of freedom to be weird 
And uh, even as I've kind of come to a more like uh, realist vibe lately, um, having some more kind of like, just like uh, when you're younger, like a willingness to experiment with fables um, and dreams and things like that. I think they, they give you some tools later on as a writer. Yeah, I love the freedom to be weird. Yeah, right? we all wanna be just weird art monsters, right? Um, and Kaya, lastly. Um, yeah, I just want to comment on things that two of you said. First of all, Bluebird, Bluebird is clutch. People don't think of the desert as being a very black space, and it absolutely is, and yes. Um, but also, I've been telling people Toni Morrison is kind of the ghost that hovers over me and always has been. I'm a Toni Morrison stan. I don't have one of her books, so it's actually holding up my laptop, but I do have the pin that I wear when I go out, and that's Toni Morrison's face. Um, but what I realize, and this is kind of um, a nod to, to your answer, Roz, is the book that I've read the most in my lifetime is The Little Prince. Um, and it is like people think of it as a children's book. I argue that it's an everybody book, but realizing like, oh, that my debut novel is a character exploring different worlds with different types and like all of this. It's yeah. like, oh, that actually seeped in much further than I was consciously aware of. And I definitely see those very much. I see a very, a lot of Little Prince vibes. And so I do think that, um, as you said, Roz, the things that you've read when you were a child or were read to you really do like leave their mark. Great, thank you, Kaya. Um, so that is all the time we have, um, but thank you so much to Ross Anderson, Daniel Hornsby, Makaya Johnson, Mega Majumdar um, for your time today and for answering all of my questions and audience questions and for sharing um, your interesting stories and experiences. Um, all of their debut novels are um, either out or coming out on Tuesday. So make sure you take note, pick them up, read them, um, and enjoy the rest of Book Your Summer Live. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Lindsay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.